Hello. Um, it's hey. my great <laughs> honor to be joined by um, co-writer and director of The Lighthouse, Robert Eggers. Good to see you. How are you doing? Great to see you. Yeah, I'm, I'm well. I'm well, uh, all things considered, Mark. Uh, um, and I'm glad to be speaking with you. How are you? Very well. Yeah. Um, you know, unprecedented times, as they say. So I'm in a I'm in a very small little home office where I'm working from at the moment, which which is fine. Nothing, nothing to complain about, really. You know, just getting on with getting on with stuff, doing a bit of writing. Um, the film that I was should have been shooting now has been put back a year, which is a shame. But I've kind of processed that now. And um, yeah. And how about you? Are, you? are you able to say where you are and what your circumstances are? Absolutely. Well, first of all, um, I'm sad that your film got pushed a year because I'm dying to see uh, your next film. It sounds uh, like your last one uh, up my alley uh, from everything I've read about it. <laughs> and uh, um, but yeah, I basically my, my film um, was uh, put on hiatus in, in March. Uh, we're hoping to uh, go to camera sometime later this summer, but we don't know. And I'm in I'm in Belfast. I'm, I moved to Belfast for for prep uh, from New York in November, and I'm and I'm still in Belfast. And uh, and uh, this is a spare bedroom that I've uh, turned into a home office. But uh, I'm trying my best, John Oliver, with a, a naked background for, for this. But I, I couldn't quite move everything out of the way. Yeah, I tried the same, but <laughs> <laughs> so. Let's let's chat, and um, I'll just get the formal formalities out of the way, and say that I'm a massive fan of um, both of your feature films. Um, I just I saw the Lighthouse um, at the London Film Festival. I was in Douarnenez in Brittany, and I was supposed to be going to London to the film festival to be on a, the short film jury, and I and. Um, I saw that your film was screening and I'd read a lot about it already. And I, you know, I'd followed what had happened in Cannes with the film. And it was, as you say, you know, it was, it was so in my wheelhouse, everything that I'd read about the film that I came back overnight across the channel from Brittany to Plymouth and then got a train straight up to Paddington and then literally ran from Paddington to Tottenham Court Road to the cinema and went in and watched your film. And I think in some ways it was in the, I was in the worst possible state to sit and watch a film. But actually, <laughs> I think by the end, it, I felt it was the most ap appropriate way of watching the film because I was sleep deprived. We'd had quite a bad crossing overnight across the channel. So I hadn't slept much. I had sea legs, you know, <laughs> and it was perfect <laughs> within, within two minutes. Um, of the film starting and the moment where your two characters are effectively staring out at the audience watching the boat go i thought this is i'm i'm actually in the ideal state to watch this film and the film has been mentioned a lot in relation to my film for some obvious reasons and some reasons that once you dig down a bit uh, are quite surface reasons i would suggest yeah for sure i you know i saw uh people started sending me your trailer as soon as it hit saying like, oh. you gotta check this out, you know? And, and I was very uh, intrigued and haunted and excited by the trailer. And, and also I'm not as obsessed with Jung as, as I seem, but I've just read a lot. And so it's easy for me to talk about things in this way, but it does seem like, you know, even though finally we were after very different things with our films there's got to be something in the collective unconscious that was kind of saying you know that that this is a that a black and black and white seafaring movies like need to be told right now for some for god knows what reason you know yeah and uh and 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 that was but that was very uh exciting to see and so when i finally saw your film i mean i was uh i was i was quite floored and and it's very it's a it's a very moving film. It's a very moving, powerful film, and it and it's it's also uh, th th there are ways in which the the sound and the visuals, um, you know, could 
if you, if someone just explained what they were, uh, um, could you might think that that might take you out of the story and Martin's experience, but uh, but but no. And uh, and 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 as I as I mentioned to you in an email, Mother's Covered, you know, had me in tears. So uh, so um, anyway, so where did this thing come from? Well, basically. My brother, who wrote this with me, Max, he um, he many years ago was trying to adapt Edgar Allan Poe's unfinished short story uh, called The Lighthouse into a contemporary horror story. And he just said to me that he was working on a ghost story in a lighthouse. And when he said ghost story in a lighthouse, I pictured, uh, I'm exaggerating somewhat, but I pictured this movie. I pictured anyway the, the the atmosphere of this movie, um, and and that it would be black and white in a boxy aspect ratio, uh, crusty, dusty, musty, and rusty, as I've said a million times, and uh, and then to make a long story very short, I, I started working on it uh, before the witch was even financed, but after the witch, when I was working on some larger things, uh, larger studio projects that were my own, but I was unsure if they were going to get made my brother and I got together and wrote something small that we, that could be, you know, potentially more achievable that I would have more control of. And, uh, and it just kind of happened that that was the film that was financed after, after the witch, after many, many, many years of trying to get other things made, that was the one that, that happened. And, and the look of the film was something that evolved over many years of, of discussion with Jaron uh, Blaschke, my my dp and and friend uh and in fact uh there were we you know we we uh we we thought about perhaps doing a a version that was processed by hand and that would be much more rough and and visually even more akin to to bait and and in and in fact uh jaron uh has a a formula that he uses when uh when he's developing uh, his black and white still photography that really increases the micro contrast. And we did some tests uh, um, uh, with that bath uh, that he, you know, processed in his bathtub uh, that that had those kind of imperfections. That was very exciting. And we, but we tried. We 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 knew we couldn't do the whole movie hand process because it was too large and with the phone patents and it couldn't be insured. Uh, but we tried to see if we could change the bath at a uh, um, at a lab, uh, but 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 it was it was they, we we could couldn't afford to do it couldn't do it but but it would have been interesting to uh, to try um, so so instead um, we uh, I mean you know we we settled on double X like like yourself uh, though you know you're you're uh, using sixteen millimeters so the you know the more grain and plus how you process it everything else. Uh, but um, I don't know. I, I'm battling. We uh, f focus my my battling mark. What's interesting is we're talking about form already, mm -hmm. and um, and I, and that's what I really wanted to talk to you about because, and you know, don't take this the wrong way. The beautiful thing about the lighthouse for me um, 
in terms of the plot and the story is its is its simplicity and also you could also you could kind of say there is no story there's a setup and then there's just this um i suppose like a, an atmosphere a, a mood and the form is absolutely key to that you know i mean in some ways it's it's shot on black and white neg 35 millimeter there's nothing unusual about that if you go back a few decades yeah but you've got the twist on it in the way that it was shot you know with the um um the cyan filter was mm -hmm. it you know so <laughs> so although you can't mess with the negative for whatever reason you know you you, you can't hand process it because it's 35 mil and it's you know you've got too many rushes and insurance issues and all that kind of stuff plus it's too expensive to get the lab to process it in any kind of specialist way. You can kind of interfere in, in you know, in, in the best sense of the word with the neg in the camera. Yeah. And so it has got that sort of experimental twist to it that isn't there for the sake of it is there entirely because that's the film. And, and I wanted to ask you, cause quite often with, with bait, a criticism has been, this film wouldn't stand up if it wasn't shot on film and it wasn't post synced. And I just think, I'm not being precious about my film, but I just think in film in general, why do we have to take form out of it, remove the form and then judge it without the form as if a film can exist without form and form and content are so linked. But for me, a lot of cinema doesn't interest me because there is no attention to form. So when a film comes along that, if you take the form away, will just fall to pieces. They're the most interesting films to me. Um, I wonder what your what your thoughts about that were, because because I I didn't you know I haven't actually read this, so I'm sort of supposing that this could happen. But you could you could look at the story of the lighthouse and go, well, that could just be a short film. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's uh, I mean, there's you raise so many uh, questions and and and. Uh, I mean, what is story? Uh, Balanchine once said when he was being criticized for doing chore like uh, choreographic pieces that were abstract, you know, of a man takes a woman's hand, what more story do you need? Uh, you know, I think um, in America, e e even more than Britain, but also in Britain more than con continental Europe, there is this kind of like traditional narrative dramaturgy that is held by many film students and, and critics to be uh, what what is good, you know, and, and having these kinds of turning points and three act structure or five act structure, whatever it is, uh, and, and, and your and how you play by those rules and tell the story is um, what makes you a good storyteller. But of course, that's absurd. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, from, you know, Shakespeare's Coriolanus is not the best way to tell that story, like the way the scenes come together, but it's so well written that it's incredibly moving. And that's like the form, even though if you were, if a screenwriter to write that today in Hollywood, there's no way you would start it and end it and like that, because it's nonsense. I think, um, uh, you know, and and I think, you know, in, in film school, not that I've been to film school, but I've I, I worked, I, I, I uh, you know, I've worked with plenty of people who have gone and I, and I think there's this idea that like, <clears throat> all you need is a great story, a great script and serviceable, serviceable performances. You don't need good art direction. You don't need good cinematography. If you have those two things, that's all you need. And, and, and I think that is true. But if you are, but if you aren't after that, uh, traditional linear narrative, then you certainly do need form to to tell your story. I mean, the lighthouse would would not survive without the, the atmosphere. I mean, that's so much what it is. It is kind of um, storyless. It's the same scene over and over and over again with yeah, changing exactly. power dy dynamics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and 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 that's you know that's what I was after my my golden fish as as Peter Brook calls it is is where the content and the form are fused into one thing. Yeah. You, you know to, to 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 your to your point. And so I think with the lighthouse, like 
um, I know that you know the aspect ratio and and uh, and on all of the format in general, you know, does 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 different things for the storytelling. <clears throat> you know, uh, it's on the very surface level. It says this is old. There's things about it that harken back to early cinema and says this is a, this takes place in the past. Uh, and and then more than that, the the black and white makes everything uh, more bleak. Uh, even a sunny day becomes uh, bleak. And with our uh, our custom cyan filter that makes it look more like orthochromatic film, that uh, changes the skin tones to make Rob and Willem look more haggard and and uh, makes the skies even more bleak. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the And the one 19 to one aspect ratio uh, is helpful to articulate the claustrophobia of the situation. And it's also a better aspect ratio for shooting uh, vertical objects like lighthouses and close-ups and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, how do how do you think the the choices that you made uh, for uh, for bait help tell that story in in particular better than than anything else, better than anamorphic uh, Alexa sixty five or whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, for for exactly the reasons you've just said, but 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 my but almost the other way around for me i i discovered that afterwards and a story i've told so many times is when we premiered the film at, in berlin somebody stood up in the q a and said to me it's great that you've communicated this ancient way of life that may be dying out using this ancient form that is also thought to have died out <laughs> and i thought oh, i hadn't thought of that and of course, since then, I've, that, that's what I've said we did. Now, <clears throat> yeah, so much is instinctual and so much. Yeah, and it's reverse engineering a, a logic to things. But also, I, th I think that's the sort of limitations of the conscious brain, isn't it? You, yeah. I, uh, this, this brain isn't kind of sophisticated enough to really understand what, what's going on. But, but I think my gut instinct is the thing that I use to make decisions. And, and the beauty the beautiful thing without being too highfalutin the be the beautiful thing about film is that when it's successful i've no idea how it works in this because it's and, and i think there is some there's an affinity between film language and the way our subconscious works and i think that's there's something in there but mm -hmm. how that works i really don't know and for me the, the films that really work for me are films you know because cinemas most of the time is two-dimensional it works with two two senses your, your sight and your hearing but the best cinema provokes your other senses yeah for sure. I don't and I don't know how that works so I mean I'm, I I don't I don't drink alcohol I haven't I haven't drunk alcohol for nearly 10 years but when I came out of your film I felt like I had a hangover <laughs> great <laughs> you're but, welcome yeah, thanks. <laughs> but also, you know, I could t I could feel the film, not the film stock, but you know, I could feel the textures within the film. I could certainly, um, you know, I could certainly smell the film. That was, but and so how does all of that work? And and I think this goes back to the idea of story again. Other art forms, there's better ways of telling stories than films. You know, sitting around a fireside, telling a film, uh, telling a telling a story with words and reading an audience and adapting it accordingly to, you know, attention and stuff like that. That's the best way to tell a, tell a story. But what film can do, which no other art form can do, I think is to create a mood, an atmosphere. And I think the way, the sense that I've made of that is, it is that evoking the dream state. So a dream isn't about narrative. A dream is about atmosphere. That's what's so powerful about dreams. It's why, you know, I find if I wake up and I've had an amazing dream, I try and describe it to somebody. It's just nonsense because it sounds like I'm either, either making it up or it sounds tedious because all mm -hmm. I'm doing is describing what happened. Whereas the, the intangible of the dream, which makes, which, you know, a, a certain dream can completely change your outlook of, of a day is to do with mood and atmosphere. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to say that, a lot of films don't do that, but certainly the films that really affect me are the ones that do that, that, of, that create an atmosphere that's 
that's similar to you know how the human brain works and the form has got to be so significant within that so i think in a roundabout way going back to answering your question i think with bait what it what elevates bait i think for me is the is the sense of the slight unreal the slight uncanny a sense of foreboding which has led you know a lot of people who've written about the film to say at times it feels like it could tip into horror you know at times it feels like a sort of it could, we could be going into sort of folk horror territory mm. that's nothing to do with the content there's nothing to do with the plot nothing to do with the story at no. all. it's some kind of un intangible that sits between sound and picture or the combination of sound and picture feel embarrassed to say that I've never uh, put together that the reason why when someone tells you their dream you're almost always bored is because the, the essential part of the dream is the atmosphere I've, I've never come to that conclusion so I, thank you for uh, for adjudicating me this, this afternoon I thought of that when I was running about two hours ago <laughs> cool. I, going back to what you said about structure as well because I, I not only did I go to film school, I, or I went to university and, and, and studied sort of production, um, but I also do a bit of teaching at, at a film school. And there is um, that way of teaching writing is definitely evident. And I would caveat it by saying, I think the way it's taught where I do a bit of teaching is it's, it's subverted, you know, it's kind of taught, but then as you encouraged to look at different ways of working. Because and, and also, you know, it's good to know the rules before you break them. Yeah. I generally think, you know. Yeah, I, no, I agree. And I think, especially when it comes to film as, a, as an art form, which is 125 years old or whatever, the idea that we've got any rules at this point, it, sure. it, it's disappointing anyway. So we, yeah. should be, we should be breaking them and we shouldn't, cer certainly shouldn't be borrowing rules from other art forms and following them um, to the letter because they're, they're largely irrelevant. And, and I was looking at The Lighthouse and there was a, a key moment that I wanted to look at. And um, while I was thinking about where this moment happened in your film, I completely misremembered where it was because the struck because your film hasn't got that structure. It's very difficult to know where you are, and it's very disconcerting. And it was the, it's the shot where um, they go out to wait for the to be picked up by the boat, which I thought was quite near the end of the film, and it's in the first half of the movie. Yeah, it's like it's pretty much the midpoint. Yeah, right? but I, I, I'd look. But... <laughs> No, I looked at um, I looked at a little behind the scenes from the making of um, your film, which I hadn't seen. Um, and it's the sh I think there's a clip of shooting that shot when they're out on the rock, when the mm -hmm. when the weather's really coming in. You can see the the characters, but also the actors. I think are sort of really struggling to stand upright, and they're, they're yeah. looking out at the horizon. And there's a bit of B-roll which is just color video footage. And it's incredible because it just blows apart. It, and I love it because it just shows the artifice of film and what you can just do by paying attention to the form, think, considering the form and creating this total other, other world. And that's the beauty of film, you know, the, the power of the edge of the frame, because on the B yeah. roll, you can see to the left, there's people with bright colored puffer jackets, you know, holding screens and whatever. And on the right hand side, there's 
something yeah. that destroys the, the the idea that you're on an island but by control yeah. it having that control at the edge of the frame it's it's yeah. just such a it was such a beautiful thing to see because yeah yeah what does it more, more now say you know like all that matters is what's in in the frame but uh you know what's outside of the frame is an absolute catastrophe uh you know uh it's funny that 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 that, that behind the scenes thing they make there was like no joking on set and i swear they found every single time we smiled and put put a, it's like a smile reel <laughs> because yeah. it was such a miserable <laughs> shoot what in what way it was just hard um the the weather was was difficult um and using this format and everything was uh crane and, and and dolly and and even just i mean we were just like even just we we, we weren't we weren't used to, to, to needing that much light on set because we're because because even if i mean you know frankly it'd been years since i'd done anything on on film and uh but but even with film and with with color film it's a different story so um the 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 the, the halogen bulbs that were in um our uh, our oil lamps were like 600 watts or something like that it was quite blinding right. when we, we were shooting those interiors so there was always some obstacle but that's fun i mean i mean yeah. you know it's not fun fun but that's the whole if it's not a challenge it's not worth doing yeah so i mean i think that with bait that i i don't remember i don't remember having a good time shooting it right but, <laughs> but i but i don't think that's a bad thing I think, no. I, you know, I always think that I'm I'm so involved with the with the film and the and the vision of it, and because I shoot my own stuff as well, and we don't have a preview monitor, so I'm actually the only person on set who's seeing what's going on. The neck. And also, you know, it, it's a tiny little camera with a very dim viewfinder, so I'm only getting a rough approximation of what's going on in, on the neck. I'm sort of so wired um i have done films where i've had more fun on location <laughs> and then i found it much more problematic in the edit because there's been this yeah that we've been oh you know everybody's been having a good time we've been getting we've been getting it and then you get in the in the in the edit and something's missing there's sort of an energy or something a frenetic frenetic energy that's missing from the footage um so so yeah i kind of I don't. I don't think it's a. It's a bad thing to. You know, as, as a director, I don't. I no, don't think no, it's no, 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 no. having a bad time. <laughs> no, no, and I think, and 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 uh, the moment that you think you have something, like when you're on set, that feeling is, you know, uh, uh, gives you all the energy that you need to keep going through all of the, the other, you know, misery or whatever. You know, and and I'm not. And again, I'm not complaining. It's just. It's no. Just, you know, it's just it's just a part of it so uh should you should we take some audience questions yeah. we, we got a uh... okay so i'll just go through these in no particular order edward hubbard asks ah is this a good one to start with what is the relationship between your three features robert uh this is a good question because uh my my uh my dp gave an interview somewhere that's been mis quoted that that is basically, basically says that the, the, my next film the northman which is a viking revenge movie is part of a, a spiritual trilogy uh with the other two and it's not uh like um obviously um i have uh i don't i have a fairly monocular uh mind and so my interests uh you know are they don't st stray into a lot of wide varieties of of anything really so the viking movie will have things in common with the, with the lighthouse and the witch of, of course but uh but uh but it's not part of some kind of trilogy but i, I would like to make another contained folk horror thing to kind of finalize uh the witch the lighthouse the something else and <laughs> we'll see what, what what that is okay another question will turner how many of the creative decisions in the film were made during the writing process? 
Uh, a lot. I mean, my screenplays are overwritten. Um, uh, an actor who turned down a role in The Northman also described my screenplay as overwrought. And I, I think that's a fair criticism. Uh, but I'm trying to like pack in as much stuff to make it really specific for all my collaborators, which can make the read a bit of a slog. Um, mm. But but because I'm directing the movie and because The Witch was made, uh, like people know what that means. Who you, you know what I'm saying? It's not like I'm an unknown quantity. I think even as a first time director, your first screenplay needs doesn't need to be something that a screenwriter for hire would write, but it needs to be a little bit more tame, maybe maybe not I don't know uh but um but I make a lot of decisions and there's no improvising in the film and uh some small things that you might think were d discovered like you know the way Willem wears his glasses like this is like in the screenplay um right. but yeah. but then I find that you get so much more by working with your collaborators one of the joys is that I have a preconceived notion about how to articulate exactly what's in my mind and then sometimes a collaborator uh, can help me to find that my preconceived notion is not the best way to articulate that. And in fact, through, through their help, I've found something that's closer to my original vision than my preconceived notion about how to articulate it, which is something that I find very uh, joyful about the process. But also I come from uh, theater and, and acting and design and <clears throat> the camera, for a long time, and it was, I was almost afraid to touch it. You know, like mm -hmm. I know that there are stories about like Fellini's first and second feature where like he didn't know where the eyepiece was. Uh, and, and, um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, was, I wasn't that bad off, but, but it's taken me some time to feel comfortable, you know, like, you know, holding the tripod and painting the camera like my, you know, and, and so, yeah. yeah, I mean, how does that come? I, I was messing up the audience questions, but I'm just curious your thoughts on doing it all yourself. I was thinking it was one way that me and you are very different because my scripts are very underwritten. So I'll pitch something to somebody and then they'll say, okay, yeah, send me the script. And um, I'll send them the script. And then they say, but nothing you pitched is actually in the script, you know? <laughs> yeah. And but, but, uh, but I actually think, you know, from what you were just saying about the glasses and things like that, I, I do write very specific detail, but my rule is always that I never, there's no adverbs ever in my screenplays. I never assign mm -hmm. feelings mm -hmm. to characters. I will just all, it will always be exactly what you're seeing in terms of action. Because my thinking is, um, and I'm coming from much less of a research, meticulous research starting point. So all of my characters and dialogue is coming from me. Every character I write inevitably is going to be a version of me. So I need, when, when the actors come in, I need their input in order to distinguish those characters from each other and mm -hmm. and from me so my way of doing that is not assigning any kind of um motivation so if somebody you know my scripts will never say somebody walks into a room excitedly or something it would just mm -hmm. say so and so walks into the room and then i'll leave it to the actor to work out how that's going to be but in, but in the same way there's no improvisation <laughs> in in what I do you know there can't be because we we don't record any location sound so we record a bit at some sort of very basic digital ca capture the sound digitally on location when they're when people are delivering the dialogue but if we're out and about on the beach and, and the wind's blowing it, none of it comes out you know I never yeah. listen I never listen back to it so if I allowed improvisation we'd we'd be really stuck you know my yeah. my lip reading skills are pretty good now but i couldn't i bet <laughs> you know in a i couldn't in a wide shot with an actor improvising i it would be hopeless so that's that's how i approach the writing in terms of sort of being across everything um yeah there's a like i said before there's a certain amount of pressure on me because i'm the only person who's seeing what's going on to the negative so there's been it, it there's been times when i've been shooting where I've been doing a, a, a close-up of somebody's eyes, for example, 
and I'll be looking for the viewfinder and I'll need the eyes to do something very specific. And it may be non-verbal, but it may be on the eyes while they're delivering a line and I'll need to see some reaction in the eyes. And I'll be looking through the viewfinder and then I'll say cut and I'll turn around to um, Colin Holt, who's the guy who lights everything for me. And I'll say, do you think we got it? And he'll say, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I was looking at a wide shot. You know, you <laughs> yeah, were looking yeah. at a close-up. He wasn't looking at a close-up. So yeah. there's a certain amount of um, absolute decisions that have to be made on the shoot. You know, the script is there to, as the blueprint for the shoot. And in a lot of ways, it's followed exactly. But there'll be certain times when I'll think, we've got to make a decision here. And I'm the only yeah. person who can decide it because I'm looking through the viewfinder at that point. I think also what's p p potentially particularly attractive about like me imagining you do your thing right now is because the, the scale of the Northman is such that, that, that Tarkovsky's haunting quote that, it, it, you know, is, it, you know, if you're making a big movie, you have to, you know, um, you're, you're in constant peril that you, you don't become a, a passive observer of other people making your film, you yeah. know? Uh, so we're we'll making a slightly which, different film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to, you have to make sure that, um, you know, as I said, I, I cherish this collaboration, but you need to make sure that 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 that's that that when it's being done differently than you originally imagined, it's uh, it's closer to your intention instead of further away from. I think for me, something that I've talked about a lot with film students is that unless you are David Lynch or Ridley Scott or, you know, what, you know, you're almost always the least experienced person on the crew as, mm -hmm. as the director. If you've made five films, that's a, that's a great career, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but everyone else in your movies made dozens, dozens, dozens of films. So you are always in the position of when do you listen to people around you who, literally know more about filmmaking than you do and when do you know when to say like well actually this is where we have to reinvent the wheel for this to be a robert eggers film mm -hmm. you know? yeah or a yeah. Martin yeah exactly and that, i mean that goes back to how young this art form is isn't it the, yeah you know it's inventing the wheel well that's 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 true too. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got to reinventing it yet okay Try another question. Um, I, okay, Rachel Pearson, how did you design the sound and music? Did you take inspiration from anywhere? And that's interesting because it's sound slash music, which is, which I think is quite um, pertinent. Because where does the where does the music and where does the sound design stop in your film? Yeah, I mean, we tried to have them overlap there's definitely some things that the that that mark corvin the composer did that would normally be assigned to the sound designer and vice versa for damien volpe the sound designer's work i'm sure that there is some some films that could come to mind for sonic influence although i'm a little bit at, at a loss i think uh i um the sound of Cape Forshu where we shot the movie was was very memorable and the the loudness of of everything was uh, quite overwhelming and in fact I don't you know I, I, I wouldn't have done post sync but originally uh, I wanted the film to be in mono and have kind of a more removed distant uh, soundtrack but what at when we were shooting the movie and you felt the power of uh, of the sea and the storms sonically we, I felt that you no, know, we needed a really big, healthy, uh, uh, over-the-top almost sound design, and it basically we tried to push everything as far as we could go. But we did still try to have some roughness to match the image, and we mixed through an analog uh, something, <laughs> you know, to so so certain frequencies distort and, and do what they would do if 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 it had been uh, all analog and. Um, you know, and the sound design, the or the or the score was meant partially to 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 deviate from the witch and be focused on horns and and woodwinds and anything you could blow into to be the 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 wind and the sea and the uh, the the fog signal house and Willem Dafoe's flatulence and all, and all that. 
uh, we did end up having some string textures uh, that that uh, like unfortunately we sort of needed to communicate some horror beats. Um, uh, maybe there was a better way to do it, but I, I we didn't find a way. We found that some of those traditional string rises. There's a reason why they're 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 sort of cliches and a, a tool in the in the toolbox. You know, when when Willem Dafoe attacks him with the axe, there's some kind of traditional horror-y stuff, uh, and and there's a very like almost tongue-in-cheek like. Da, 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 da. When when Defoe is describing like being marooned on the island, one of his fellow light keepers being marooned on the island, you know, it's, right. it's almost over the top. But yeah, it, it sort of I think works. that that's the type of thing I'm thinking of. I don't think it's. I think it, that there's one somewhere else. But it, it, you know, it feels like it's earned. You know, it's not. It's not a cheap. It's not a, a cheap device. I mean, like, the movie, the, the movie is very self-aware for better and hmm. for worse, you know, and so, and so that enables us with that particular film to get away with that kind of stuff. I generally like to be more earnest, but, but there is something that's absurd about the movie that, 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 that makes it self-aware. If you'll uh, forgive me, I just want to say, like, mention three images from the film that have really stuck with me, which I've made a note of. Um, One's obvious, the tableau, which is just, you know, with, the, with yeah. the, hopefully I'm not spoiling this for anybody who hasn't, I'm presuming everybody's watched the film if they're watching this. Um, presumably that was, is, is that one of those early, early images that you have before, as your, that you build the script around or, is, or yeah. did that come later or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, to, to, to be quite honest, like, uh, that that image, uh, which I'm not particularly proud of, is is near plagiarism of of uh, work by um, uh, a German uh, symbolist uh, artist, Sasha Schneider, uh, an image called Hypnosa. Um, but yeah, I think early on with with my brother in discussing things, like very very early on, it was like, okay, this is how it begins, this is how it ends. He finds a mermaid at the midpoint, and somewhere like you know at the turning point this image has to happen you know uh, or a version of this image uh has to happen so yeah that was very early on okay and i don't think it's plagiarism if you if you if you mention it i think that's fine then isn't it <laughs> i guess <laughs> the the second the second moment is the um is very early on in the film it's probably only two or three minutes in where the two of them are just staring out and they're staring straight down the lens and that's the moment where I thought I'm going to love this film because the fourth wall was being broken and they were looking straight at me. You know, I was in the cinema with however many hundred people, but they were staring straight at me and there was nowhere to hide. And then, and then you cut to the point of view shot and they're watching the, the tender leave and, and suddenly it means something else. But also there is a definite moment where Robert Pattinson's character is looking at the audience. You know, for me, there's a moment where I think Willem Dafoe's character leaves and he, there's a moment where it's like, it's all over. We're two minutes in and <laughs> ready. This is oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you saw it that way. That's, that's fantastic. So, and, and the third one, the one that really uh, I absolutely love is the moment where time stops making sense. And suddenly, for me, the film becomes unreliable. So the two characters are kind of unreliable. But once the film becomes unreliable, that's so unnerving and that's where i think that the horror for me is the horror isn't in the situation that the circumstances the action the story that the horror is in the fact that at that point where you know how long have we been on this rock five five weeks or two days that moment where i, I it's just everything is untrustworthy at that point how long have we been on this rock Five weeks, two days. Where are we? Help me to recollect. Who are you again, Tommy? I'm probably a figment of your imagination. This rock is a figment of your imagination too. You're probably wandering through a grove of tag alders up north in Kennedy, like a frost bit maniac talking to yourself and i'll mention that that monologue is uh is uh dubbed 
to make it more un unreal and uh, you really? know so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well and also the way it's lit and the way it's shot he's almost when he's saying it, he's almost like he's not existing in in the location anymore he's out of space and time and then it made me go right back to the beginning of the film and the moment that really bugs me about the film in terms of what is really happening is the moment where they arrive on the island and the two of them walk past the two light housekeepers that have been relieved and they don't acknowledge each other and then i'm thinking and then so suddenly <laughs> that takes on a different meaning <laughs> hold on you know these people who do everything or you know especially william defoe's character who does everything by the book he doesn't even acknowledge those two guys and it's suddenly hold on i don't trust anything anymore so yeah cool. just, just my thoughts <laughs> not not a question cool um all right should we do one more and then uh I'll do Cameron Smith's question, which was um, addressed to both of us, which was, who would win in a fight? Martin from Bait or Winslow from the Lighthouse? Martin, hands down. Y you think? Yeah. I, I don't know. I think that Willem Dafoe could kick Martin's ass, but, uh, but, but, but I, think, I think Martin would, would, take, uh, would take Pattinson. <laughs> You're yeah, not sure? I, was, I was wondering about the specifics of the fight because whether if it was a fist fight or whether or whether he actually still had the axe. <laughs> yeah, well, the axe the axe definitely uh, changes things. <laughs> I, I don't think Martin would fight him. I, yeah. I, th I think he would recognize the deep trauma behind the eyes and probably try and put his arm around him. That's nice. I like that. Yeah, because I think deep down Martin's a he's a he's a lover not a fighter so that's true good question though <laughs> that is a good question and 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 good to you know end on on a fun note yeah well maybe that's the th maybe that's the film the third in your um <laughs> your trilogy <laughs> fate versus the yeah. lighthouse <laughs> yeah perfect cool Who do i talk to you about getting the rights to to make a bait sequel um i'm sure you yeah, possibly. I don't know. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, uh, you know, if anyone hasn't seen Bait, you better watch it. Uh, um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, thanks, thanks, uh, BFI for having this conversation, making this conversation happen. Well, and thank you, Robert. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and getting an insight into the way you work. And just, uh, you know, Same. I can't wait to see the new one when, when it's here. done. Um, I was talking to my producer, Denzel Monk earlier, and uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that he is incredibly excited about your new movie. So- um, Well, I'll try not to let him down. <laughs> and I just want to say, um, just on, on behalf of the, the BFI, thanks everybody for listening. And also, um, if you've enjoyed this, and if, you, if you're in any way able, um, to, to make a donation to the BFI. Um, they're, they're happy to accept it um, whilst they're putting this work out, uh, or this work, putting these events on um, during these unprecedented times. So um, thanks again, Robert. Thanks to BFI. And um, yeah, watch The Lighthouse. You won't regret it. Bye, everyone. Cheers. Cool.